I'm glad to be here. The Black Comics community is important to me, has always supported me, and uh, I'm happy to work with you. Well, um, in July 1963, an age when you know I was like 12 years old, and you know people were saying, "Why are you still reading comic books?" But I, I love comic books, and it was on a vacation trip with my family that I came across. Fantastic Four Annual Number One by Stanley and Jack Kirby, and I still think that's the greatest comic that was ever made. It's the comic that made me realize people got paid for making comics, and I wanted that job. So pretty much from the age of twelve, I started training myself to be a writer, a comic book writer. I would uh, act out stories with with those, you know, hard plastic green army men from Mark's Toys. Uh, I would try to write and draw my own comic books. Uh, I'm not an artist. They so didn't look too good. Um, I used to, you know, in grade school and high school, I'd find friends who would draw my stories. I did stories for um, various fanzines. Um, but what really got me started working with characters of color was I grew up in Cleveland, which was a really segregated city in the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, there was a lot of white flight going on. Uh, and I had a comic book club that had meetings at uh, the Cadell Recreation Center, where many, many tragic years later, uh, a young man was murdered by police. Um, but I had these comic book clubs. I was maybe about 17. And my first black friends were comic fans who came from the east side of Cleveland to the west side of Cleveland to attend my meetings. And at 17, diversity isn't really part of your vocabulary. I just thought it was unfair that my black friends didn't have more characters like themselves in the comics. And told myself that if I ever was lucky enough to get into comics, I would try to work on and create characters of color. Um... Ironically, those I, I, I still am in contact with those three friends, but they didn't realize until a year or two ago when I started getting interviewed a lot because of the Black Lightning TV show that they were the inspiration for my taking my career in that path. Um, I went to work for the Cleveland Plain Dealer, not a good newspaper. It's a tool of the rich and the, and the powerful. We went on strike. Uh, the the publisher called the mayor. Our picket line was attacked by mounted policemen. I was knocked to the ground. Horse's hoof landed inches from my face. Dusted myself off. Went home. By that time, I had my own own place. And uh, called Roy Thomas, who was a friend uh, who had just been named editor in chief at Marvel. And I said, Roy, you got any kind of work for me up there? They needed somebody to assist Stan Lee on various projects. Mm -hmm. And from there, it was just, you know, you're hanging around. You're showing them that you could do the job. They give you more and more responsibility, more work. Um, I I, I uh, did some emergency fill-ins on Luke Cage and Captain America and ended up writing Luke Cage regularly for a while. Um, created Misty Knight during a, a three-issue run on Iron Fist. Uh, and then when I got to DC Comics, um, I got the chance to to create my own. You know, I've been, In my mind, I was building towards the black superhero I really wanted to write. Um, and I got the chance at DC, uh, but not in the normal way. Um, <laughs> DC hired me. Um uh, and they wanted me, they showed me, they gave me two scripts that they had purchased of a character called the Black Bomber. Uh, they wanted me to punch up those scripts and then take over the book with the third issue. Uh, the Black Bomber was a white racist who took part in camouflage experiments to help him blend into the Vietnamese jungles better. Nothing happened to him in Vietnam, but when he came back to the States, he would turn into a black superhero uh, randomly, as near as I could tell. Uh, in each of those two scripts, as the white racist, he saves somebody. And then when he realized he saved a black person, gets all pissed off that he risked his life for a black person. 
including a scene where he rescues a baby in a baby carriage, sees it's a black baby, and literally says in the script, you mean I risked my life for a jungle bunny. Uh, each identity had girlfriends who witnessed the transformations but never said anything. And just to put the cherry on this shit Sunday, his uniform, his superhero costume was basically a basketball uniform. Wow. wow. I went to DC Comics and I said, you can't publish this. And he said, what do you mean? We bought the scripts. I said, no, you can't publish this. These are the most offensive scripts I can imagine. If you publish this comic book, people will come to your offices with torches and pitchforks. And they're going, how could you know that? I said, I'll be leading them. It took me two weeks to boil down my argument to, do you really want DC's first headline black superhero to be a white racist? And then, the, you know, then their eyes open up and they realize, yeah, I guess that was a bad idea. Now, in all fairness to the people who created this character, the Black Bomber, Jerry Conway and Robert Kaniger, these are good, these were good, decent guys. Very liberal, very progressive. What they thought they were doing was like a superhero version of the Godfrey Cambridge movie, The Watermelon Man, which is a fine movie. I, I, I've watched the movie several times. But it didn't work. It didn't work as a comic book, and it was offensive and racist as a comic book. They were too close to it to see that. So I had a couple of weeks to create my own character, which I did. I was Black Lightning. Uh, and and so in, in retrospect, so, you know, later, some people have claimed that they weren't going to publish it, but I know what I was told. They, they handed me the scripts, asked me to, to do a little bit of rewriting on them, and then take over the book with the third issue. So they were planning to publish this. Um, it took, I had about two weeks to create Black Lightning, but I had a lot of ideas in mind already. Um, I wanted them to be someone kids could identify with, which is why he was a school teacher. Um, I wanted him to fight crime in, in the inner city, which turned out to be suicide slum of Metropolis, because I was, you know, I was a lower middle class kid, and while I certainly didn't have the experience of Clevelanders who grew up uh, during this period of, of greatest segregation, you know, Italians were under a little bit of, uh, Italians got, a small share of that. Uh, everybody assumed that if we were Italian, we were part of the mob. Uh, so I wanted to do inner city stories. Uh, I wanted to have the mob involved, the drug pushers. So I gave Black Lightning, or I gave Jefferson Pierce, the skill set to handle those stuff by making him an Olympic athlete. And then the idea of him coming back to teach at his old high school, I totally stole that from Welcome Back, Cotter. Uh, Wow. But uh, in about an hour before the pitch meeting, when I would be talking to Joe Orlando and Sal Harrison, um, love Joe, never liked Sal. Uh, he used to refer to me as DC's black writer, uh, which, and, and not in a good way. <laughs> wow. uh, but about an hour before the pitch meeting, I realized I had, had not come up with a superhero identity or power set for Jefferson Pierce. Uh, I was so into creating Jefferson Pierce and his world that I kind of left out the superhero part. So I'm wandering around the DC offices because writers are supposed to be able to think fast on their feet. Walked into Julie Schwartz's office where I saw a rough sketch for a Wonder Woman cover in which she's standing on her robot plane or a building lassoing a black lightning bolt and saying something like, here, help me stop this black lightning from destroying the city. Well, it was the 70s, and I thought, gee, you know, black lightning, that, that's a catchy name. So, you know, about a half an hour before the pitch meeting, I had black lightning, and I had some idea of his superpowers, and went into the pitch meeting. They loved the idea. Uh, we sat down and worked out a creator agreement which would have made me their equal partner. I was stupid. It's not. A, it wasn't in writing, and they violated it within a week of of my starting work on Black Lightning. 
Uh, and that's pretty much been my history with DC Comics. Uh, yes, I get some benefits from them, and they'll sometimes stick to the at least the letter of contracts with me. But overall, nah, you know they they always you know they never give me exactly what I'm due, and that not just the money, the the respect. You know they constantly do in the comic books do stupid stuff with Black Lightning. They they really do not understand the character. Uh, they prefer him as Batman's support Negro. And uh, have him. What's important to Jefferson Pierce is his family, his students, and his community. And in this latest crap Batman and the Outsider series that they did, he leaves all of that behind to move to Gotham to do Batman's jobs, living in a penthouse apartment paid for by Bruce Wayne. I assume that Bruce Wayne would come to the apartment and leave the money on the table for, for Jeff. Um, Jeff and Katana, who was created by my buddy Mike Barr, in the original Outsider series, Mike crafted a beautiful platonic relationship between these two adult friends. Nothing romantic about it. You know, making, you know, having a hero have a romantic interest being someone else on the team. After all these years, that's the cheap way out. That's easy. Um, and besides, Jefferson Pierce's soulmate is and always will be Lynn. Um, but DC Comics decided that Black Lightning and Katana had to be a romantic couple. And the last time I checked in, apparently they had turned him into Living Lightning and he was living in Katana's sword. Correct. That's right. not my Black Lightning. Right. Uh, and the thing is, the T. Oh, they also had Batman experimenting on him to give him greater powers, apparently having never heard of the Tuscany uh, experiments. At the same time, the TV show was doing a storyline referencing those mm -hmm. experiments. Right. The TV show got it right. Mm -hmm. I love the TV show. They, you know, I was involved early on. I mean, I wrote the yeah. core values paper for the show. Mm -hmm. uh, when they hired the brilliant Salim and Mar Brock Akeel, we had hours of conference calls. They flew me to Burbank to spend a day with the writers. Uh, I was always welcome on the set and, and treated with great love and respect on the set. Um, friends with many of the cast members and some of the writers who, during the run of the show, would sometimes you know, contact me to ask me questions about characters. Uh, so really, I, I, the Black Lightning TV show was the height of my career in, in terms of really getting the respect that I was due. And I actually got to be on it. Uh, right, I played right. a federal judge in the third season finale. It, it started with Jeff Johns. Who would who did who wanted to do a Black Lightning series, but wanted to make sure I had a new contract that treated me more fairly, um, and then like DC's publicity department, uh, Larry Ganam and some of the other people were very good about keeping me, you know, putting me together with the TV show people, and also I mean the TV show folks understood right away where I was coming from, which is. Comic books are not the same as TV series or movies. You know, I never expected a slavish devotion to my comic books when they were doing this series. What was important to me and what they did was they honored the core values of my creation. Uh, they gave myself and Trevor Von Eden credits right up front, you know, at the start of every show, uh, which I think should be standard uh, for the industry. I mean, you know. Moon Knight, the, the credits for Don per for Doug Mench and Don Perlin should be in the front credits, not, you know, in the back. Um, but yeah, the show always treated me well. Uh, I, mean, I, I would go there and I'd have hundreds of people, you know, tell me over the course of the, the four years that thanking me for their jobs. And it's really mind boggling to know that something I had written in 1976 and 77 something that DC Comics never truly respected, was now employing all these people. Uh, 
And you know, one one time I, they they were filmed in Decatur, Georgia, two big big buildings. And I was walking around the back lot, and the head of the construction crew, you know, saw me and, and asked me to come over to the construction crew because knowing that I was going to be on set, uh, the crew had brought comic books for me to sign. Uh, and I really got an appreciation for how hard and fast the TV people work. Uh, that same day, he took me to a set they were building. It was the prison where uh, Tobias Whale would be incarcerated for most of the third season. And uh, they had just started building it. It was like 9 or 10 in the morning. And we filmed on that set that evening. In fact, for a brief moment, I was going to be in that episode. Uh, Salim had wanted to know if, if the costume department had a guard's uniform, uniform that would fit me. And I was actually, I told Salim, I said, you know, Salim, okay, look at those guards that you've already got. They're big, they're buff, they're scary. Look at short, fat me. <laughs> One of these things is not like the others and would distract. You'll end up cutting this any scene I'm in because it won't look right. And if you do leave it in, it'll distract people from what's actually happening. So he said, yeah, you're right but we'll get you in in the third season. And so they, they brought myself and Trevor Von Eden in to play uh, federal judges. I was going to go into how you feel about them changing uh, like power sets and characters that you've written. Like you, you touched upon that. I was reading how you were talking about how they took Luke Cage's uh, super strength from him. That was... Um... When I was writing Luke Cage, uh, the my dear friend Len Wein, who's sadly no longer with us, Len would get these notions in his head. I used to call him the editor savant because he would come up with these things that only Len understood. And at one point he told me that Luke Cage didn't have super strength. And I said he punched his way out of a prison. And he goes, well, that's because he's invulnerable. So he was able to keep hitting the wall <laughs> until he got out. And, and I'm telling you, Len, that would take him a hundred years. <laughs> you know, so so as as I did with most of these suggestions of Len, I said, oh, sure, okay, I understand. And then I ignored it because Len wouldn't remember it uh, uh, further than that. But yeah, but but as far as I could tell, we, we never, in the comic books, he always had super strength. Yeah. Uh, and of course, he, he certainly had super strength in the TV series. Uh, maybe not, you know, maybe not on the levels in the comic books, but they were there. And again, you know, TV shows and comic books are not the same thing. Uh, if Luke Cage was too powerful in the TV series, it wouldn't have rung true for what they were doing. I want to skip to something that could be deemed controversial, and you're just going to have to correct me if I'm lying. But I am a, I'm a big um, Misty Knight fan, <clears throat> and and follow me on this. One. This is my theory, and I and, and I will be floored if I'm right. So, when we talk about comics, you created uh, Misty Knight, correct? Yes. We talk about comics. Her first appearance is in uh, Marvel Preview, the Iron, uh, the Iron Fist book. She comes out and she's fighting. And you don't see the robotic arm or anything. I know people have their own definition of what a superhero is. People will say, oh, well, she, it was Misty Knight technically came about in Marvel Team Ups number one. Um, and that's a retcon. But I, I, when I look up the definition of a retcon, a retcon is when you go go back and you actually change something. It was not they didn't change anything. They just clarified they quote unquote who that was. And I, I don't think you had any dealings with that. I believe because when Misty Knight first appeared, and her when her origin was given that she was a police officer, she uh, was a bomb going off. She kind of sacrificed herself. Her arm got messed up later. We we found out Tony Stark's and this was stuff that was added on later, uh, gave her this arm. Um, and she was, a, she was part of the detective agency. Um, I, I just really feel, and you're just going to have to just correct me. I just really feel Mr. Knight is for all rights and purposes. I'm going to say this. Are you ready? All rights and purposes. 
the first black superheroine in mainstream comics. When you add up everything, but you're going to help me with that one. Um, well, let's see. First off, let me say, Chris Claremont did all the heavy lifting on Misty Knight. Um, I created her because I wanted Danny Rand, Iron Fist, to have somebody to talk to. I absolutely hated writing second-person captions. You are Iron Fist, and you've just been kicked in the face. I hated writing that kind of stuff. So I figured I'll give him somebody to talk to. I never saw Misty as a romantic interest. I saw her as kind of like the older sister who would be constantly, you know, letting naive Danny Rand know when he was being an idiot. Wow. Uh, it was Chris who made it a romantic thing, which, you know, I mean, I wrote Misty Knight for two pages. She was created because I wanted somebody to, uh, for Danny to talk to. Uh, I just seen, uh, Oh, what was the name of the movie? Uh, Black Belt Jones, which had a uh, Gloria Henry played a female martial art artist who I thought was pretty cool. Although she, you know, Misty was drawn to look like Pam Greer because really, Pam Greer, who doesn't love Pam Greer? Um, as far as the Marvel team up, that is utter and complete bullshit. <laughs> John Byrne has this thing that's wrong in his head. Uh, it was the kind of thing that he decided that Flint Marco, the Sandman, had to be related to Norman Osborn because they both had bad Ditko hair. Mm -hmm. That was the same thing at work here in that, you know, by them saying that the Marvel team-up woman who didn't act or sound like Misty at all was Misty because, really, how many black women with afros could there have been in New York City? One, two, you know, 10,000. I mean, it was stupid. And I will call it stupid till my dying day. <laughs> uh, you know, she didn't need to be a background character, to be retconned into a background character in a, in a Marvel team up that came out like years earlier. Right, Misty's right. got a lot of her own stuff going on. She's a great character. She was, uh, I, I like her a lot in the comics. I thought she was best in the TV series. Uh, Arvel Jones and I were invited to the premiere of Luke Cage at the Magic Johnson Theater in Harlem. So awesome. Arvel and I got to meet Simone Messick, who played Misty. We have a nice picture of her uh, with the two of us. I call the picture Misty Has Two Dads. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, and again, people who, the, the actors who work in the superhero movies and TV shows, for the most part, and I've never met one that wasn't incredibly pleasant, they like being part of these super universe, superhero universes. They like knowing that they have a fan base going into these productions, and it's not lost on them that, uh, you know, if their acting careers go south, they can go to conventions and make several thousand dollars for every convention they attend. Uh, everyone, you know, everybody on the Black Lightning, in the Black Lightning cast was wonderful to me. Um, you know, the Luke Cage ca cast, I, I interviewed Mike Coulter uh, at, at a couple of conventions. Uh, we did panels together. Uh, when Marvel invited me to the Ant-Man and the Wasp premiere, uh, I got to chat with Paul Rudd, um, uh, and, uh, I'm blanking on the name of the, oh, how could I blank on his name? He's brilliant. The guy who played Bill Foster. Uh, uh Lawrence Fishburne. I'll tell you my best story from that, from the after party at that premiere. My wife, Barb, has had a crush on Michael Douglas since she watched him as a little girl on streets of San Francisco. So she had gone off doing something and I'm talking with Michael Douglas and telling him how much I loved his work, you know, in things like the American president and, and things like that. And Barb comes over and I say, you know, um, I said, I want to introduce you to my wife, Barb. She's had a crush on you since streets of San Francisco. And he takes her hands looks deep into her eyes and says, oh, my dear, you're much too young to have seen me in that. Mm -hmm. Two thoughts go through my mind. 
this is how this guy married Catherine Zeta Jones. <laughs> and the second one was, is Barb coming back to Cleveland with me? <laughs> Fortunately, three. she did. Arvel Jones and I are the creators of record for Misty Knight. Mm. Me for coming up with her and Arvel for telling me as we walked out of the movie that it was a good idea. Uh, right. And then drawing her in her first appearance. So we're the official co-creators, but Chris Claremont really did all the heavy lifting. Um, gotcha. And I tell Chris that every time. I also tell him, I'm keeping the money, but you did all the heavy lifting. Directly with Billy Graham. I would have loved to. He was an incredibly nice guy, a very talented guy. Uh, I worked with Billy Graham when, um, you know, Steve Englehart had quit the book. It was in terrible shape schedule-wise. So the first, the first one I did uh wasn't even Luke Cage wasn't even you know they they threw a reprint in the back of the book and I think that Billy might have plotted that I don't remember for sure I don't remember whether we talked about it and he plotted it or he plotted it and then I scripted it uh the second one we did together uh that was uh I believe that was a full script uh, because again, time was just so short that I needed to write a full script for that issue so that, you know, it could get, you know, it could get into production sooner. Uh, but I never got to work with her. I mean, that's a question to ask Dom and Greg, because they were, they were very close friends and boy, they brought out the best in each other. You had said that, uh, a black man was the first person to write and illustrate the first story in Detective Comics number one? Not so sure that's correct. I've received information suggesting otherwise, and I'm still uh, researching it. I will say that there have been black writers and artists in the industry since the beginning, but yes. there were no credits. Right. Um, Oh, there's a great book uh, by my friend uh, Ken Quattro called Invisible Men. And uh, that's a terrific <laughs> book. Um, and there's still more to be found. There's still more to be found. Um, there was a guy, I, I can't remember his name, but for like three issues, there was a strip called, I want to say Calvin, that Marvel published in a uh, back in the early 70s. And that was written and drawn by a black guy, but I've never been able to find any information about him. Lawrence really wanted to get big in that movie. <laughs> and apparently there was a scene written, a flashback scene. And I don't know if Lawrence is in the next movie, but he really wanted to get big. <laughs> Well, one of the things, I hate to see good characters go unused. It's why I turned Greer Nelson into Tigra, and it's why I turned Bill Foster into Black Goliath, although I had always wanted to call him Giant Man. He told me I couldn't do that because Giant Man sold really badly mm -hmm. in Tales to Astonish. <clears throat> so my initial reason for coming up with him was that Luke Cage needed more powerful opponents. Um, and I thought Bill Foster using the giant powers would be a good way to go. Uh, when they greenlit it for a series, I said, okay, this is a chance for me to advance a black hero. So while he still had the, the, the ghetto background, uh, again, that's, you know, that was in a, in a way my life. Um, he was a scientist. He was running his own division of Stark Industry and his whiz kids, as he called them. That was, you know, I always loved Doc Savage and his aides. So I wanted to give Bill Foster, you know, basically a group of aides that I tried to make different. Some of them were based on people I know. Uh, but yeah, that was my aim was, okay, we've got Luke Cage, who's an ex-con. And I never really liked that about Luke Cage because, uh, you know, and had I stayed on Luke Cage, he would have been proved totally innocent. And I actually wanted him to go back to school. 
because I thought that would be a positive message. Uh, I hate, hate, hate that Steve Englehart made the Falcon a criminal. That was just dumb. It was. And and when I was writing Captain America, which you know, I didn't stay on that long because Jack Kirby wanted to came come back, and who better to write to do Captain America than Jack Kirby? But my plan was to kind of get him out of the legal any legal ramifications and never mention it again. Uh, I'm a big believer in never mentioning dumb stuff again. Uh, if I ever write Black Lightning, you know, all the stuff that they did after my Black Lightning Cold Dead Hands will be gone, as if it never existed. I will never refer to it. It will never be part of any of my stories. Um, but as I said, with, with, with Bill Foster, I wanted him to to be a step up from from the crime influence of, of some of the earlier black characters. And uh, so I made him a scientist. Uh, and had I continued on Black Goliath, I was, there's a lot of upheaval at Marvel in those days. I was getting shifted around. I was getting ready to leave to, to go to work for DC Comics. Um, but yeah, I, I liked, I thought I had done, given Bill Foster a good start. And then in one of their many stupid crossover epics, they killed him. Because, you know, black guys die first. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's just that kind of attitude that, that, you know, you're told that black characters don't sell, but they don't get promoted. Um, Static Shock. When Static Shock was on TV, it was getting great ratings, uh, it was winning awards, and the only Static Shock toy I saw at that point was a giveaway at Subway in my local Medina Subway, Medina, Ohio Subway, which baffled me because Medina, Ohio is unfortunately really white and really Republican, and I wasn't quite sure why our subway had the static shock thing, but of course I bought it as soon as I saw it, but apparently it wasn't even a national uh, rollout, it was a regional thing. Hmm. So uh, maybe you know, maybe it was a shipment meant for Detroit, and it ended up in Medina. What? Only one I ever saw. Okay. And again, what the what the heck did Static Shock have to do? It was getting great ratings and winning awards. Uh, how high was the bar raised for Static Shock that it didn't get the merchandise it should have gotten? And while things have been a little bit better with Black Lightning, still doesn't have the merchandising it deserves. Uh, man, every time I, I have a Black Lightning cap from the set, and I've been offered $200 for it. And when I, I actually contacted DC and said, I want to make these. I said, if you haven't licensed them out, you know, I will license them. And, and they said, well, you can make a few for yourself. I go, no, I want to make thousands of them. Yeah. It was some of the cast members didn't want to return. Uh, and as much as I love those cast members, I would have recast if it were my decision. Uh, I hate the idea that shows end or good characters vanish from a show because the original actor doesn't want to play them. Uh, and again, I love the the actors who, you know, who wanted to leave and, and their their work on the show. But I would have recast. But again, not my decision. Um... I don't know how people can say Black Heroes don't sell. Black Panther was monumental. Um, Black Lightning merchandise, I mean, it's even the old issues of Black Lightning are hard to come by. We need to know, because it's a running joke uh, in the community, why Black Goliath is always getting knocked out. Always. On covers, he's all. So we need to know. Not my doing. Okay. <laughs> you know, the one issue of Black Goliath I wrote, he wasn't getting knocked out. He was, you know, taking names and kicking ass. Right. right.